Okay, let's open our Bibles to our sermon text for today, Luke chapter 6. As you can see on the screen behind me, today we will be studying verses 1 through 5. As we see picked grain and the Sabbath controversy, we will also be celebrating the Lord's Supper today as well. Now let's read God's holy word. Chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Now it happened that he was passing through some grain fields on a Sabbath, and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain. But some of the Pharisees said, Why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answering them said, Have you not even read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priest alone, and gave it to his companions. And he was saying to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This is God's holy, authoritative, inspired word of truth. And all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Well, today we are following Jesus and his disciples as they make their way back north to Galilee. If you recall, uh, we had left off on our study of the Gospels where we saw Jesus in Jerusalem. He had been there for a Jewish feast. And remember, Jesus demonstrated his deity by healing a man who had been very ill for 38 years. And remember how the religious leaders, the Pharisees, responded to Jesus' healing. They weren't happy. They were upset with Jesus because that healing occurred on the Sabbath, which they said was against God's law. And then remember how Jesus responded to them, declaring his deity to them, making himself equal with God, and they wanted to kill him because of that. That all happened in Jerusalem. And then remember, Jesus even called forth his unimpeachable witnesses who would testify to the deity of Christ. Remember? Jesus said that the word of the Father testified to the deity of Christ. The works of the Son testified to the deity of Christ. The writings of the Holy Spirit testified to the deity of Christ. The witness of John the Baptist, the witness of Moses, testified to the deity of Christ. And you would think at that point that the religious leaders, after seeing Jesus demonstrate his deity by healing that guy, after hearing Jesus declare his deity, and after hearing Jesus call forth his witnesses who testified to Jesus' deity, you would think the religious leaders at that point would have bowed their faces to the ground, they would have humbled themselves, and they would have declared, Jesus, you are the promised Messiah. But they didn't do that, did they? Well, what happened after that episode there in Jerusalem? Well, that's what we're going to study today. It seems that Jesus and his disciples turned north and were either on their way to Galilee when they stopped in a grain field, or they just arrived in Galilee and stopped in a grain field. So it was probably springtime, around 28 AD, and Jesus now had left Jerusalem. And again, whether he was on the way to Galilee or already in Galilee, we're not certain. But here's what we do know. That his disciples decided to pick some grain. They were hungry. And boy, was there an explosion because of the Pharisees who had been following Jesus and his disciples in the grain fields. Boy, was there an explosion. A Sabbath controversy. Now let's read verses 1 and 2. You can underline some words. We read that now it happened that as Jesus was passing through some grain fields, again he left Jerusalem, 
heading north or was already there in Galilee. He was passing through some grain fields on a Sabbath, underlined Sabbath. His disciples were picking the heads of grain, underlined picking. They were rubbing them in their hands, underlined rubbing. And they were eating the grain, underlined eating. So here we go. We're setting up the scene here. Luke tells us that Jesus and his disciples ended up in a grain field. And Jesus' disciples were hungry. So what did they do? They picked some grain. They rubbed the grain in their hands. They tossed out the chaff. And they ate the grain. You with me? They picked grain. They rubbed the grain. They tossed out the chaff. And they ate the grain. And how did the religious leaders respond to Jesus when they saw this? Verse 2, some of the Pharisees said to Jesus, why do you, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Uh, Matthew's version and Mark's version say that the Pharisees said to Jesus, why do your disciples do something that's unlawful? Uh, but ultimately, even when they said that the disciples were doing something wrong, they were accusing Jesus because they were his disciples. He was their teacher. So we see now what happened. Jesus and his disciples were in a grain field. They picked grain, they rubbed grain, they tossed out the chaff, and they ate the grain. And we see that the Pharisees said to Jesus, Why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now imagine that. Jesus, God in the flesh, right? The perfect God-man. The law-giver. These religious leaders had the audacity to say that the law-giver was the law-breaker? Well, where did they come up with this? I mean, do you see any law of God being broken? By picking, rubbing, and eating grain? These guys were hungry. What law of God concerning the Sabbath, what law of God in the Old Testament did they break? Well, let's just take a quick look through a couple passages in the Old Testament to see what God had to say about the Sabbath and let's see if these Pharisees actually had a reason to get upset, right? Uh, let's go real quick. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. This is where we see the first mention of a Sabbath. Verses 1 through 3 we read, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his what? Work. Six days of creation, seventh day, God rested. Why? Was God tired? No. But God was setting in place a cycle. Six days of work, seventh day of rest and refreshment. And God set that in place for us as humans, right? So God rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day. Jewish calendar, seventh day would be a Saturday, right? The Sabbath. So we see God, who blessed the seventh day? God. Say it again. Who blessed the seventh day? Who set it apart? God did. Remember that. 
We'll come back to that in a little bit. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctify it, set it apart as a special holy day. Why did God do this? Because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So, we see here in Genesis 2, God instituting the Sabbath. God blessed it. God set it apart. And God made it clear. Six days work. Seventh day, you're not allowed to do the same work you were doing the previous six days. The seventh day is a day of refreshment, rest, recovery, rejoicing in the Lord, focusing on the Lord, worshiping the Lord, finding your strength in the Lord, right? Did the disciples of Jesus break any laws that we just read? I don't see anything, do you? Now, let's go to Exodus chapter 20. We see here, Exodus chapter 20, God's people were on the way to the promised land. They took a stop at Mount Sinai, where God, through Moses, gave his commands to his people. And here in Exodus 20, in the Ten Commandments, verses 8 through 11, we see God commanding his people, the nation of Israel, regarding the Sabbath. We read, God said to them, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and the Lord made it holy. So we see God giving in the Ten Commandments a specific command about the Sabbath. Six days, do your normal work. Seventh day, you don't follow that same cycle. You rest, you recover, right? Genesis 2, we see the institution of the Sabbath. God blessed it. God set it apart. Exodus 20, we see God giving his command to the people regarding the Sabbath, right? Now, did Jesus' disciples break any Sabbath law? I'm not sure I see anything at this point, do you? Well, maybe they were referring specifically to what God had said about being in the grain field on the Sabbath. Go to chapter 34, Exodus, same place, and let's see maybe if this is what the Pharisees were referring to. Exodus 34, we read in verse 21, God commanding his people, you shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Here we go. Even during plowing time and harvest. On the Sabbath you shall rest. So we see here, God now was being very specific. Again, remember that was an agrarian society back then. You had a lot of grain fields. And when there was a lot of rain, a lot of sunshine, great opportunity to be able to uh, plow, uh, bring in the harvest, bundle it. Why? To sell it for profit. Well, God said, for six days, you can do that. But on the seventh day, the Sabbath, God didn't care how high the grain grew. God didn't care how much harvest was available in the grain field. On the Sabbath, God's people were not allowed to plow, 
and harvest for the purpose of obviously eventually making a profit on that, right? Well, is that what Jesus' disciples were doing? I mean, they were eating. Why did the Pharisees say that Jesus and his disciples broke the law of God? Oh, oh, I know why. When Jesus and his disciples were in the grain field, was it their grain field? Were they the owners? No. So maybe the Pharisees said that Jesus and his disciples were breaking the law because they were in somebody else's grain field, picking grain, you know, rubbing it, uh, throwing out the chaff and eating. Were, maybe that's what they were referring to? In fact, I know in Deuteronomy, just hop there, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, God specifically deals with that issue. Deuteronomy 23, verse 25. Remember, again, when back then, people walked everywhere, right? They didn't have planes, trains, or cars, or they rode on a donkey or whatever. Now, their journeys would be long journeys. And of course, people would get hungry on the journey. And because there were grain fields everywhere, obviously people would pull off the main road, go to a grain field and start to eat. Well, God gave his command regarding that. Verse 25, God said, when you enter your neighbor's standing grain, it's not your grain field. You enter somebody else's grain field. Look what God said. You may pluck or pick the heads with your hand. God says you're actually allowed to do that. You're allowed to eat. But you shall not wield a sickle to start plowing and reaping and harvesting in your neighbor's grain field so that you can then take that and go sell it and make a profit. Do you see it? Again, remember, the people were walking a lot of times. They didn't have restaurants along the way to be able to stop and eat. And they weren't able to carry on their backs, you know, two weeks worth of food. So, of course, they would get hungry on the way. But look what the Lord said. You're allowed to go in somebody else's grain field. You're actually allowed to pick their grain and eat it. But don't steal it from them and go and try to sell it and make a profit. Don't start to get a sickle and start cutting it and cutting it, taking and bundling it so you can go eventually take a profit. God said, you can't do that. So, doesn't sound to me that that's what Jesus' disciples were doing, were they? Uh, go back to Luke chapter 6, our text for today. Let's see if we can make sense of this. Why were the Pharisees accusing Jesus and his disciples of breaking the law of God? Luke chapter 6, we repeat what we read, verses 1 and 2. We see now that it happened as Jesus was passing through some grain fields on a Sabbath, and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. Then they would toss out the chaff and eat the grain. Doesn't sound like they were doing this for profit, were they? I don't know. I don't see them breaking any of the laws of God on a Sabbath. Do you? But, verse 2, some of the Pharisees said, Why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? What in the world were the Pharisees accusing Jesus of? Watch me. They said that by picking the grain, that was equivalent to reaping a harvest. They said by 
rubbing the grain, that was equivalent to threshing, separating. They said by tossing out the chaff and then eating the grain, that was equal to winnowing. And that's why the Pharisees said that Jesus and his disciples were breaking the law. It wasn't God's law because nowhere in the Old Testament do we see that. The Pharisees made their own human traditions. And they set up their human religious traditions around God's word and even over God's word. So much so that they actually came up with their own traditions that said picking grain is equivalent to reaping it. Rubbing grain is equivalent to threshing. Eating is equivalent to winnowing. That's why they said that Jesus and his disciples broke the law because they said, up oh, by doing this, that Jesus and his disciples were actually working on the Sabbath. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? I mean, are you kidding me? But this is what the Pharisees and scribes always did. They denied the sole absolute authority of God's word. And instead, they added their own human traditions to be next to or even above God's word. So they believed God's word, the Old Testament, to be true. But they did not believe that God's word was sufficient, that it was the sole authority. That's why they elevated their human religious traditions to be next to God's word. And they came up with all kinds of crazy do's and don'ts regarding the Sabbath. For instance, they said that on the Sabbath, a person was allowed to walk from his or her home only 3,000 feet on the Sabbath. That's it. If they went 3,001 feet, they broke, they say, the Sabbath law. Okay? But the Pharisees also came up with another one. They said, let's say, uh, uh, day on. The night before the Sabbath, takes some food from his home and takes that food and places it at the 3,000 foot mark. They said, now Dayon was allowed to walk an additional 3,000 feet on the Sabbath. Why? Because they said that Dayon, by taking food from his home and placing it here, here, was equivalent to Dayon's home. <laughs> so now Dayon could walk 3,000 feet on the Sabbath plus an additional 3,000 feet. It's insanity. There's another one. They said on the Sabbath, you're allowed to toss something in the air and catch it, but you have to catch it with the same hand that you tossed it with. If you toss it with your right hand and catch it with your left hand, they said you broke the Sabbath. Crazy, huh? How about this one? You weren't allowed to bathe. To go in the bathtub, put water in, you're not allowed to bathe on the Sabbath. Why? Think about the bathtubs back then. Very small, right? What would inevitably happen with the water once you got inside of the little tub? The water would spill out. And they said, you're not allowed to bathe because 
What's going to happen is when the water spills out, you're going to naturally want to wipe the water from the floor. They said that's working on the Sabbath. And ladies, this one's for you. Ladies, you were not allowed to look in a mirror on the Sabbath. You know why? Because if you looked in the mirror and maybe you found maybe a gray hair, you would be tempted to pull it out and the Pharisee said that was work on the Sabbath. So when it came to what Jesus, what Jesus' disciples were doing, you see why the Pharisees said, Ah, oh, no, no, they're working. What do you mean they're working? They're just picking, they're rubbing, they're, 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 they're tossing out the chaff, and they're eating. What kind of work is that? Oh, 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 that's equivalent to reaping, threshing, and winnowing. That's works, and that's why they said to Jesus, Why do you do what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Of course Jesus wasn't breaking God's law. Jesus, the perfect God-man, is the lawgiver, right? But Jesus, according to the Pharisees, was breaking their religious human traditions. So how did Jesus respond to them? Verse 3, Jesus answered them and said, have you not even read? Stop right there. <laughs> See what Jesus said here? They said, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, um, have you not even read? Two things on that. When Every time you look in the Gospels and Jesus responds that way, have you not even read? You realize he's rebuking people. It's like, you have the audacity to accuse me of breaking a God's law. Have you not even read God's law? You, the Pharisees, who are supposed to be the experts on God's law, you, the Pharisees and the scribes, who are supposed to be the guardians of God's law, have you not even read? So Jesus was rebuking that. But there's a second thing. When Jesus says, have you not read? He's referring, obviously, to the Old Testament, right? Because the New Testament wasn't written at this point. By saying, have you not even read? What is Jesus saying about the whole Testament? It's authoritative. It's God's authoritative word. It is sufficient. It is clear perspicuity of scripture that's called and it is necessary Jesus obviously had a very high view of the Old Testament but of course right <laughs> unfortunately today a lot of people are taught that as Christians We really don't need to study the Old Testament. We can unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. That was for the Jews back then. I don't know. If Jesus thinks the Old Testament is God's authoritative word and is necessary for us, shouldn't we think the same thing? So here, after the religious leaders accused Jesus of doing what was not lawful on the Sabbath, verse 3, Jesus said, Have you not even read? Have you not even read what David did when he was hungry? Who's David? King of Israel. Which king? Second king. Who was the first king? Saul. Good king, bad king? Bad king. David was the second king of Israel. Good king, bad king. Good king. And we'll see why that's important in a few moments. Jesus said, have you not even read what David did when he was what? Hungry. 
he and those who were with him. How David entered the house of God. And David took and ate the consecrated bread. Which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests alone. And not only that, David even gave that bread, the consecrated bread, to his companions. Your attention, please. Uh, Old Testament, God gave law saying that every Sabbath, the priest was required to put fresh consecrated bread, show bread, on the table there in the holy area. You guys know, you have, uh, whether it's a tabernacle or the temple, you have the courtyard, you then come in, you have the holy area, you have the curtain, and then behind the curtain, the most holy area, right? The holy of holies. Well, here in the holy area, you had the table of presence, and that's where the every Sabbath, the priest would come in and he would put 12 loaves of consecrated bread on the table. Why 12? Symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? So that fresh bread would be put out every Sabbath. The next Sabbath, the priest would come in with 12 new fresh loaves of bread. What did he do with the 12 loaves that had been there for a week? He removed them. But he, as the priest, and only the priest, was allowed to eat that older bread, right? Well, Jesus says to the Pharisees, Oh, you want to accuse me that I'm breaking the, uh, the Sabbath law? Have you not even read what King David did when he was hungry? Uh, let's go read the story real quick. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21. First Samuel 21. Again, who was the first king of Israel? Saul, right? God removed him and was going to put his own king, King David, in that position. Well, Saul, was he happy when he found out that he was no longer going to be king and that David was going to be? Not quite. So Saul was constantly trying to kill David. Saul became a madman, right? Well, here in chapter 21, David and his companions had been running from Saul. Saul was out to kill David. So naturally, when David and his companions came to this place called Nob, or City of Priests, which is about a mile away from Jerusalem, David and his companions were exhausted. They had been running for a while. They were thirsty and they were what? Starving. Let's see what happens. Chapter 21, verse 1. Then David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? David said to Elimelech the priest, The king has commissioned me with a matter and has said to me, Let no one know anything about the matter on which I am sending you and with which I have commissioned you. I have directed the young men to a certain place. Verse 3, Now therefore, David, starving, asked the priest, What do you have on hand to eat? I'm starving. We're starving. Give me five loaves of bread. Which bread was he referring to? Well, the only bread that would have been there. The bread in the holy area. Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. The priest answered David and said, Well, there's no, uh, there's no ordinary bread on hand. In other words, I can't go down to the bakery and just find you ordinary bread. There's no ordinary bread on hand. But there is consecrated bread. The show bread that the priest would put out every Sabbath, there's consecrated bread. 
And then the priest said, Okay, I can give you that if only the young men have kept themselves from women. David answered the priest and said, Surely women have been kept from us as previously. I mean, the poor people, they were running. They didn't have time for women, right? Surely women have been kept from us as previously when I set out and the vessels, the bodies of the young men were holy. Though it was an ordinary journey, how much more today will their vessels or bodies be holy? Verse 6. So the priest Ahimelech gave to David what kind of bread to eat? The consecrated bread. That was the only thing that was available. You know the bread that was to be in the holy area? The priest gave him consecrated bread. For there was no bread there but the bread of the presence which was removed from before the Lord, right? Every Sabbath, in order to put hot bread, fresh bread, in its place when it was taken away. And naturally in verse 8, God got so upset with David and the priest, we read that God's holy wrath was poured out on David and the priest because David ate Holy bread. Is that what it says? Nope. Nope. In fact, nowhere in Scripture are we told that even though that bread of presence, once it was removed, was only to be eaten by the priests, we see that the priest, looking at David and his companions and thinking, they're going to starve to death, he gave that bread. And nowhere in Scripture are we told that God uh, condemned David or that priest. Why? Because nowhere in Scripture does God say, let people die on the Sabbath because it's the Sabbath. Of course you can offer mercy to somebody even on the Sabbath, right? So let's go back now to Luke chapter 6. Again, starting in verse 1, we know it happened that as Jesus was passing through some grain fields on a Sabbath, and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain, the poor men were starving to death. Some of the Pharisees said to Jesus, Why do you do what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them saying, Um, have you not even read? You experts of the law? Have you not even read? What King David did when he was hungry, he and his companions? How David entered the house of God, there in Nob. He took and ate the consecrated bread. Which, oh, by the way, was not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest alone. And not only did David eat that bread, he gave it to his companions who were also starving to death. And notice Jesus doesn't say, and God struck them dead. Why? Because nowhere in Scripture does God say, if someone's starving to death, if someone's dying from a disease, if somebody you know uh, is in a life-threatening situation, nowhere does God say, "Well, Sabbath, you gotta let, just let them die." And that's why Jesus really nailed the Pharisees by saying, "You, you never read? You know King David? Obviously, you know King David. You're religious leaders, right?" You know who David is. Haven't you read what happened there? Oh, you can imagine religious leaders going, oh yeah, we read that. We know that story. Well, how come God didn't strike them dead? And then look what Jesus says in verse 5. And Jesus was saying to them, the Son of Man, referring to Himself, is what? Lord of the Sabbath. Look on the screen. The religious leaders say, why do you do not what is not lawful 
Jesus said, have you not even read? And then Jesus says, oh, by the way, you know the one you're accusing that you're saying is breaking the Sabbath? I'm, I'm the Son of Man, and I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Um, remember back in Genesis 2, we saw that God blessed the Sabbath and set it apart as holy? Who did that? God did? What is Jesus saying about himself? He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's making himself equal with God, right? Um, remember, God is the one who gave in the Ten Commandments the command about the Sabbath. What is Jesus saying about himself? Um, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. And that means he's the only one who has the right to judge if the Sabbath is being broken or not. Remember um, when God gave the commands about, you know, being in the grain field, you're not allowed to plow and thresh and make a profit and so forth. Um, Jesus says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And what Jesus was saying is this, just as God did not condemn David and the priest for eating that bread so they wouldn't starve to death, David and his companions, in the same way, Jesus says, I and only I have the right to judge when it comes to the Sabbath, because I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And what you Pharisees are saying that my disciples have done wrong, I am saying to you, I don't condemn them. And you can't either, because I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Does that make sense? So again, the Pharisees had the audacity to blame the lawgiver. They said he broke the law? She said, wait a second, haven't you even read? And oh, by the way, the one you're standing here and accusing, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm God. Did Jesus ever declare his deity? <laughs> right there, right? In fact, let's look at Matthew, Mark's version real quick. And we'll, uh, we'll come to a close here. Matthew 12. Let's see. Matthew gives us a little bit more information that Jesus had said in that grain field. Matthew 12, verses 1 through 8. We read, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful on the Sabbath. Again, by blaming Jesus' disciples, they were also blaming Jesus, right? Because they were his disciples. Verse 3, uh, Jesus said to them, um, Have you not read? <laughs> have you not even read? I love that statement. Have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions? how he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat nor for those with him, but only for the priests alone. And look what Matthew's version adds that Jesus said. Verse 5, Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath? Well, how do they do that? What are they doing on the Sabbath in the temple? They're serving! They're ministering, right? And yet, look what Jesus said. But they are innocent, innocent in God's eyes, because God and God alone has the right to judge what is lawful and unlawful on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, verse 7, quoting Hosea 6.6 6 in the Old Testament, what God said, I desire compassion, not sacrifice. If you had understood this, you would have not condemned the innocent. And again, Jesus says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Go to Mark's version, chapter 2. We get a little bit more information there about some things Jesus said in the grain fields. Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28, we read, And it happened that Jesus was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along, picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, 
Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need? And he and his companions became hungry. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, who was the son of Ahlimanech. And David ate the consecrated bread which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest. And he also gave it to those who were with him. And here we go. Uh, Mark's version adds this. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man. In other words, the purpose of the Sabbath given by God, and here is Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, explaining that purpose, saying the Sabbath is for man to rest in the Lord, to recover in the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord, to find refreshment in the Lord. The Sabbath was made for man. Six days you work, but the seventh day in the Lord. The Sabbath was made for man not the man for a Sabbath. You see, the religious leaders were putting all of these human, man-made religious traditions on the shoulders of the people to the point that the Sabbath became so brutally oppressive. Nobody could rest in the Lord. Nobody could rejoice in the Lord. They were carrying this massive yoke of human traditions regarding the Sabbath. They could barely make it through the day. They were so confused with all these different do's and don'ts. Do we take a bath? Do we not take a bath? Uh, you know, do I toss it in this hand or toss it in that hand? Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not the man for Sabbath. And then he says in verse 28, and so the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So we see Jesus brilliantly rebuking the Pharisees who had the audacity to try to rebuke Jesus and his disciples. Have you not even read? Oh, by the way, the one standing in front of you, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I judge what is right and wrong in the Sabbath. Because I'm the one who is Lord over it. And I'm not condemning my disciples because they've done nothing wrong. And therefore, you cannot say a word against my disciples because they've done nothing wrong. And you're not the judges. I'm the judge. Does that make sense? Do you see how human man-made religious traditions can cause confusion, oppression, and it leads to people being in bondage to these human traditions thinking that they're pleasing God when in actuality they're simply slaves to the human religious traditions. And I think many of you can relate to that because you were brought up in that. So just like the Pharisees and scribes 2,000 years ago put up their own interpretations 
about the Sabbath and so many other things. Today, unfortunately, there's nothing new under the sun. How many religions in the name of God are misleading people putting them in bondage to man's traditions, man's doctrines, as opposed to the word of truth. That's what the religious leaders, in fact, let's just go to Mark 7 and we'll conclude here. Our text that we read prior to our time of prayer, Mark chapter 7, again, verse 5, we read that the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the what? Tradition of the elders. But they eat their bread with impure hands. And Jesus responded to them. Rightly did Isaiah, the prophet who prophesied 700 years before the birth of Christ, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, look what God said. This people honors me with their what? Lips. But their heart is far away from me. But in vain, God said, do they worship me. Well, why? Because they teach as doctrines the precepts of men, not of God. Verse 8, Jesus said, you neglect the commandment of God and you hold to the tradition of men. Verse 9, he was saying to them, you are experts at setting aside or tossing aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition." Now listen carefully. There's nothing wrong with tradition per se. Uh, you know, we have a tradition in our ministry that once a month we celebrate the Lord's Supper, right? But we don't slavishly bond ourselves into that. Okay? And, you know, tradition. Many of you maybe have family day on, on Sundays for lunch or dinner. That's a tradition, family tradition. There's nothing wrong with that. So tradition in and of itself is okay, except when tradition replaces God's truth. Now you have a problem. And that's what those religious leaders back then were doing. And unfortunately, you see that in all kinds of religions today. Here's what they say about God's truth. Thanks, no thanks, and they toss it aside. And instead, what they do is they say, you know what? Let's come up with our own interpretations of religion. Here's what you're allowed to do per our tradition. Here's what you're not allowed to do per our tradition. Yeah, but what does the Word of God say? Ah, no, no, the word, that, that's back then. No, 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 we've got our own traditions. Do this and you'll be saved. Don't do this and you won't be saved. Give this and you'll be blessed. Don't give and so forth. And friends, that is not of God. That is of the devil. If you take any human teaching and you make it authoritative, equal to God's word or even above God's word. What you have done is you've denied the authority of God's word. You've tossed God's truth aside and you're left with man's ideas. Really? What did Jesus have to say about that? Haven't you read? And yet today, and maybe many people you know, they have all kinds of opinions, beliefs, when it comes to how God should be worshipped, where God should be worshipped, when God should be worshipped. They have their own opinions, their own ideas, their own thoughts. Really? Really? 
So we as fallen, finite humans have the right to define how God should be worshipped? What? We have the right to say, well, look, um, you know, this is how, through our traditions, our rituals, this is how we can please God. Where did you get that? Well, the traditions. Haven't you even read? That's all around us, just like it was back then. I mean, you think about it. these religious leaders who were supposed to be the guardians of truth. They tossed God's truth aside. And they came up with their own interpretation of things. Can't take a bath on Sabbath. You may spill water and be tempted to wipe it. That's work. Can't look in the mirrors, lady. You may see a white hair, gray hair. You may be tempted to pick it. That's work. Jesus, why do you and your disciples break the law of God? And today, just like back then, you think of these religious leaders. Why did they have all these traditions? Because they were trying to impress God through their own efforts. Look how holy, look how righteous, look how religious I am, God. You need to accept me on that day. You need to let me into heaven. Look at all these things I've added to your word, God, and that I'm following. And those people, as Jesus said, many on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this, do this? And Jesus is going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And the same today. So many people have their own ideas, their own opinions, their own interpretations on how they're getting to heaven. Well, haven't you even read? No, we don't need to read the Bible. Well, what do you mean you don't need to read the Bible? Well, then how do you know what, what God says on how you get to heaven? Well, this is what I feel. This is what I think. Really? Is anybody concerned about what God says? God thinks? What God feels? No, see, people don't want to read God's truth because inevitably when you read God's truth, what does God say about you and me? <laughs> that we're beautiful and lovable and cuddly and that God's going to accept us in heaven no matter how we live down here on earth? No, that's not what God's truth said. Haven't you even read? God says we are wretched, miserable sinners on a highway to hell, and there's absolutely nothing we can do through our own efforts to make ourselves right in God's eyes. Haven't you even read? And no amount of human religious traditions, no matter how... Uh, uh, how good your intentions are. Guess what? Good intentions don't get you to heaven. In fact, the Bible says good intentions, <laughs> human effort, human tradition, apart from God and His grace, get you to hell. Haven't you ever read? But praise God, God is a God of love and mercy. And God's love and mercy is not that He lets us live any way we want to live and do whatever we want to do. And then on that day, we just show up and He's like this Santa Claus and say, oh, you were okay, da, da, da. let me just let you in. No! Haven't you ever read? Hell is a real place and real people are going to be there and real religious people like these Pharisees who thought that they were so wonderful and so spectacular because of their human traditions and had the audacity to try to condemn our Lord who's the Lord of the Sabbath. Those people, apart from Christ, they're in hell for eternity. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Experiencing God's just judgment forever. Haven't you even read? And that's why we want to be people of the book. We want to know what God says. 
And so we know that God says we're wretched, miserable sinners and there's nothing we can do through our own efforts to make ourselves right in God's sight. But God is a God of love and God in His love. 2,000 years ago, the Father sent the Son, God the Son, to this earth. Jesus, the perfect God-man, born of the Virgin Mary, born uh, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, meaning no sin nature, and the perfect God-man perfectly fulfilled all righteousness for us in our place. He did not break one law. He fulfilled every law in our place for us, the lawbreakers. And then he allowed himself to be hung on a cross where our lawlessness, our sins were placed on him and God the Father punished him, the perfect one of heaven, the Lord of all creation, the Lord over all. He was punished in our place as our substitute. He died the death we deserve, but three days later, he rose in victory. What does that mean? He overcame sin and death for us. Christian, he paid for your sins in full in terms of that day of judgment. And you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Haven't you even read? Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Jesus plus anything or anyone equals damnation. Haven't you even read? And my hope and prayer is that every one of you are 100% certain that you have trusted in Christ alone. Trusted in who He is the perfect God-man, trusted in what He has done for you, fulfilling all righteousness for you, and perfectly paying for your unrighteousness once for all time. I pray that you have trusted in Him and that you have cried out to Him, have mercy on me, the sinner, and that you know that you're in God's family forever and that you are not falling into that satanic trap of tossing aside God's Word and following human religious traditions. God's truth leads you to eternal life. Because God's truth leads you to the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Man's religious traditions, tossing aside God's truth, lead you to pride, self-righteousness, self-delusionment. This leads you straight to hell. We want to be people of the book. You want to master this book and you want to let this book master you because God's truth feeds you. God's truth leads you. God's truth protects you. God's truth gives you discernment. God's truth convicts you. God's truth crushes you. God's truth rebukes you. God's truth counsels you. God's authoritative truth is all we need for salvation, for sanctification. It is all we need to know how God desires to be worshipped and deserves to be worshipped. That's why we are people of the Bible. Nothing but the Bible and absolutely everything in the Bible. That which God has graciously given to us in the canon of Scripture, the 66 books of the Bible. This is God's authoritative holy truth. And everything God wants us to know about Him is right here. And every day, you and I have to make a decision. 
Are we going to hold firmly to God's truth no matter the cost? Or are we going to hold firmly to human religious traditions because we're afraid of the cost of God's truth and instead we become compromisers to please man. Think about your life, your family, how you want to live the rest of your life here on earth. Following man's plans, man's traditions, or God's holy truth. Amen.